Hey everybody, Ashley from Recording King here. I want to welcome you to the RK family on this Friday. We update our feeds frequently with all kinds of different stuff like instrument demos, artist interviews like this one. We love to give away guitars, so please check us out on social, follow along. We want to share what we're doing with you. Today's guest is internationally known Grammy-nominated Phil Ledbetter. He's won IBMA's Dobro Player of the Year multiple times and been inducted to the Atlanta Country Music Hall of Fame, but those are just a couple of the hundreds of accolades he's earned over his 45-year career. From his time with J.D. Crow in the New South to his solo music, he's brought some of the sweetest sounds ever out of the resonator guitar. He's also one of the most genuine and friendly people that I've met in the industry. We'll learn some resonator history from one of the all-time greats today. Please help me welcome Phil Ledbetter. Hey, Phil, really great to have you with us today. Hey, man, how you doing? Good to, good to see you. Always good to see all the uh, fine recording king folks and get to put a face on, on everything. So thanks for letting me be part of this today. It's just awesome. Yeah, we're really, really glad to have you. Thank you. So what, what's been going on? What have you been up to? How have you been doing? What, what's well, the month been like? With, with the corona stuff, everything slowed down for us. You know, I was also uh, doing all the talent buying at Bean Blossom, which is the Bill Monroe Music Park. Uh, festival up there has ran 54 years, so it's the longest running. And this is the first year we've missed because of the corona. So it's been a mess because you have to book and cancel and, and all that. And we tried to salvage it and book again. So I've been doing that. Been in the studio uh, doing uh, my band, uh, the All Stars of Bluegrass. Uh, we did a new album coming out called Swing for the Fences that should be out the 25th of this month, but it's already hitting the radio. Uh, the All Stars uh, is me, uh, Alan Bybee, a great mandolin player from Grasstown. My good and dear friend Steve Gully uh, playing bass and singing uh, tenor. Steve's really sick right now, so I hope you guys will remember him. He's a, a good fella and my dear friend. But he's playing bass and singing for the band. Jason Burleson from Blue Highway playing banjo. And uh, another guy that I've played with a whole lot over the years, Robert Hale. Worked with him in Wildfire and also with J.D. Crow. He's playing guitar and uh, singing. So we've got three really strong singers in, in the band. And the uh, new single is coming out uh, called, uh, uh, what's it called? I'll think of it in a minute. We've been going through so many songs here trying to get stuff. It's it's uh, it's hard to, hard to remember because we've released, we released a couple of them early, but this is the official, official release. And it's a uh, One Way Rider, that's the name of it, Rodney Crouch and, and Ricky Skaggs had it. But uh, we've got a really cool cut. we got uh, all three guys singing a verse, so uh, you know that's that's pretty good. I don't know if anybody that's that's done that uh, in bluegrass, so it'll be fun. I'm curious to see how it does on radio, and so far we've had really good feedback on it. Uh, what? How did all of those all of that massive talent come together for for one record? Tell tell me about how you got everyone together and what the recording experience was like. Well, here's what happened uh, a couple of years back. Uh, they hired me to uh, to play here in Knoxville for WDBX Radio. They wanted a big uh, concert. So they gave us a budget, and I just started going and getting people to play with. And we had a lot of people. We had uh, one of our original members of the band was Claire Lynch. She was here before Robert. But Claire moved to Canada and made it hard for us to do so. Anyway, I used Claire that night, a lot of good players. We had about 20 players on stage. And afterwards, I thought, you know, why not pick the people from here that, uh, you know, are easygoing, uh, are friends, and seem like it'd be easy to travel with because, you know, a lot of music's traveling. You know, if you if you don't get along off the stage and try to act like you're a family on stage, it don't work. But all these people were friends and brought up the idea about, uh, hey, let's call it the All-Stars. And and these guys didn't want their name attached to it because, see, Alan Bybee's got his own band, uh, Grasstown. Robert Hale's got Wildfire. Uh, what's funny, that's two bands I, star, I helped start. And uh, anyway, they both got them going on. Gully uh, has his band, New Pinnacle, and Jason Burleson with Blue Highway. So we didn't want it to look like the people start calling and saying, man, has Blue Highway split up or did you leave the band? 
So putting my name out front did this for me. Uh, if ever one of the guys are busy, I can go get another all-star to replace to replace that person. And so far, we've not had to do that. Uh, everybody has uh, been good. And, man, it's a lot of fun playing with those guys. They make you play at a whole different level. So, uh, oh, man. And, they're, and they're all the best. I mean, Alan Bobby just won Man of Player of the Year at the IBMA. And he's won probably seven or eight at Spigma. And, uh, you know, Burl, Jason Burleson, Blue Highway, they won tons of stuff. So, uh, you know, everybody's got a, their own uh, fan base. It helps out. So are you guys touring? Are, are you changing your plans of how you're going to promote the record now that no one is touring? Or what? Wh- how do you think that's going to come well, together in the coming months? Well, we're definitely not going to be able to get out there to promote it. But, you know, everybody's on the same playing field right now, uh, doing the same thing. So we're just having to get creative with this. And, uh, you know, the, the, record, the record company, we're going to do a couple of videos off of this we got one song on there with steve warner a lot of people probably know steve he's a mega uh country music star uh which steve wouldn't let you call him that he's very humble but uh chet atkins uh was really big fans Uh, they were fans and friends and and chet made him one of the i think two or three members of uh the organization for uh uh, master guitar players, uh, I think it was called. Uh, uh, I'm not even going to attempt it. I can't remember what it's called, but it's a it's a little organization that not many get into. For a while, it was just Chet and Steve Warner is there now. So Steve sings a song called "I Want to Go Back," that is a tune he wrote, and uh, it's you know I'm hoping radio will pick up on that, but. Seems like this new tune, One Way Rider, all the stations are kind of going a little, uh, as they said, oh, brother, they're going a little apey over it a little bit. So I'm hoping this thing really starts showing up on playlists pretty good. Yeah, certainly a lot of star power for sure. Yeah, definitely. Well, so when we were, when we had talked about getting on this call, I was reflecting back to a conversation that you and I had had a couple of years ago. And I, you really had such a, such an awesomely detailed response. The question was pretty simple. Why resonator? Why did you, why did you choose that instrument? And you kind of took me back through your history. So yeah, tell me a little about that as well. kind of a funny story. I will condense it. But when I was uh, probably 11 years old, uh, my brother started playing banjo and he had a good job, but he still, for some reason, my brother had a good job, but still lived with my mom and dad. Never figured that out. Thought he'd have his own place. But the good thing about that is he had a good stereo. We didn't have any, you know, upstairs or nothing. So he'd go to work and he was playing banjo and I'd slip down his bedroom. And it was always, I, I didn't know anything about what was popular at the time because we didn't hear it. But I did know when I went down, he had some really cool stuff that had banjo and everything on it. But there was an instrument in there that really caught my attention, and I found that it was a dobro, and it was played by Josh Graves, uh, Uncle Josh. So uh, anyway, I got to tell you the funny story on this. I took up dobro, and I was I was left-handed. I played left-handed for a while, or not for a while. Let's say in, in, a, in a kid's life, uh, three months is a long time. Yeah. I played about three months left-handed, and my brother kept changing the strings over right-handed, which is another good thing for having your brother still living with you. Uh, he kept changing my strings, and I get mad because I, I learn a song left-handed, and I come back and it's right-handed. So finally, I just give up. And that was one of the best things I did is give it in because it made it easy to go into stores and find uh, resos like a recording key in there. You don't find left-handed instruments much. And uh, anyway, I, I started playing right-handed. And the funny thing, I'll tell you this story. A lot of people have enjoyed this on my Thursday throwbacks on Thursday night, of course, Thursday. Uh, but uh, I went, Josh Graves was going to be in town. And he was a guy to listen to on this record. So he was mega star. And I only learned one song. The only song I knew was a song called Shuckin' the Porn, an instrumental uh, tempo, but it's the only thing I learned. I knew nothing else. So I go over to see Josh Graves, and uh, somebody tells me, I mean, it's the time I had hair. I mean, that's not what they were telling me, but 
at this time I had hair and everything and, and I was about 12. So somebody tells me, they said, hey, Josh just went in the back door. And it's like, wow, really, Josh Graves. So I go run to the restroom to make sure my hair's in place and all this stuff. And I slam the door and I hear a big boom and I hear somebody cussing. And it's Josh Graves. Josh is sick and he's down on his all fours around the toilet throwing up. So anyway, most people would back up and leave and say, oh, wow, you know, but not me being a kid. I It was Josh Graves. So I pushed my way on in and he's down on his all fours still. And I throw my hand out and I say, hey, uh, Josh, my name's Phil Ledbetter. I'm a no-grow player. And I stick my hand out and Josh sticks his hand up and his hand's all sticky where he's been straddling around that toilet with his hands. And I shook his hand and, and I felt like an idiot. I didn't know what to do. But, you know, a lot of people tell me, man, I bet you didn't wash that hand for months. And it's like, no, I washed it immediately. Cause oh, I <laughs> so anyway, the story goes on that night. Josh invites me up on stage to play a song. And this was a big deal. I mean, it's Josh Grace to me. I mean, this was Elvis Presley bringing yep. me up. So uh, anyway, I get up on stage and I knew one song. So Josh says, well, what do you want to pick there, son? And I tried to act like I knew a lot of stuff. So I sat there and said, oh, let me think for a minute. And I knew there was no thinking involved. I only knew one song. So I said, uh, hey, uh, there's a song called Shucking the Corn. How did you want to do it? And we played it, and then a guy, which is Josh's nephew, one of my buddies, too, from then, Tim Graves, come up and join us, and we played that. Well, at the very end of it, Josh said, uh, oh, pick us another one. And I looked around a little bit, and I said, hey, Josh, I bought tickets to see you play. I didn't buy tickets to see me, so I went and sat down and left that night, and Josh thought I, I knew a whole lot of stuff, knew one song. So uh, if there was ever a good bluffing off uh, – uh, to get somebody and work your way out. I did pretty good that night, I think. But yeah, was- keeping on your feet is very helpful when you're a musician, for sure. So g- good job. I'm sure that served you well over, over the years, no it, doubt about it. It. It, it did. It was funny when Josh became good friends over the years and uh, and up to the time he passed away. And I told him that story one time, and he laughed and said, if I knew that, I'd have made you stay on stage and made you sweat. So... <laughs> Anyway, Josh was a good guy. Very, very much missed. That's awesome. Well, I was thinking about how how Resonator was not one of the original bluegrass instruments. But no. the popularity of bluegrass and the popularity of Resonator have kind of had a similar trajectory. And so I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about how, how Resonator yeah. kind of made it into the slipstream and then how that's kind of helped grow bluegrass. Well, Josh Graves, you know, brought it in. And then you got guys like J.D. Crow, who was a big master of the music. And I worked with J.D. And it was funny because when I got my job with J.D., it was 1991. And there wasn't many dobro players. I mean, when I started playing, there wasn't. There wasn't hardly any. I could count them on my hand. But I was asking J.D. about playing in his band. And the previous dobro player had been Jerry Douglas. And... uh so I asked J.D., I knew his music pretty good, and, and I said, uh, J.D., I was wanting to talk to you about movie playing, and J.D. says, you know, I never did like no bros, and it's like, oh, wow, he still got the same thing, and uh, he said his reason for not liking no bros is when Uncle Josh Graves came in to flatten Scruggs, it knocked Earl Scruggs out of a banjo break. It's like Earl was already taking four. He didn't need no more than that. So anyway, that was like in the early 90s with J.D. and Dobro was still coming along. And J.D. told me he liked them after Jerry Douglas left because it sounded good in his music. Well, you know, Bill Monroe's the one that defined the instruments and said it won't be this, it won't be that. And what's ironic is I'm booking Bill Monroe Bluegrass Festival now. I'm a Dobro player. And last year on the festival, I had 10 Dobro players that I had hired. But, man, it's just uh, the dobro just really fits. And I don't think it's really about what one guy says that these are the instruments. This music is far from what it was when it first started. It's evolved so many times. It's not your old uh, farm music, if I say it that way. It's, it's not that anymore. It's evolved and split so many ways. 
and uh, what's bluegrass called bluegrass now used to be just called uh, an, an acoustic music. And now acoustic music is a little further out and the stuff that was acoustic music is bluegrass. So uh, there's a lot of them out there. I mean, when I started, like I mentioned, about five that I can mention, and I would say, oh gosh, playing out there on the scene right now, there's probably at least 30 to 50 uh, that are people who are traveling and then the people that are playing in the jam systems, there's hundreds. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of them are playing recording kings, which is a smart move because the recording king made it, uh, has made it possible for a lot of guys getting into this music that, you know, the dobros were so expensive. And I'll, I'll, I'll say this real quick, but dobros were so expensive if you wanted something that sounded good. And otherwise, you could go get something uh, in the four or $500 range, it was, it was no good. They, they weren't really playable. So you had to be an excellent player just to get a decent sound out of them. And then when I talked to Greg Gritch about the, doing a dobro with Recording King and he wanted to put my name on it, uh, I told Greg, I said, uh, Greg, if we could get something around $1,500, we could challenge some of these guitars uh, that are in the $2,000 range. And Greg said, we'll do better than that with it. And uh, he surprised me when these things came out and they were so so uh, priced like they are. I mean, they they are such good quality. People look at these things and they'll say, uh, I tell them the price, you know, on them. And people say, no, no way. You know, they don't, they don't believe that until they go look online. And uh, so this is... Having great a great instrument out there is going to bring more dobro players in uh, to music because you know you've always been able to get fairly good guitars and fairly good banjos, but this recording king of mine, man, this is way over the top. I mean, it's not fairly good. It's it's excellent, and I tell a lot of people about it, and and uh, it's good to see them out there now. Well, thanks for saying that. We're pretty proud of it also, definitely. Well, so Very good. When you're talking about people who are carrying the torch kind of forward here, who are you thinking of? I guess, obviously, let's, let's start with your, your own family for sure. I'm sure mm -hmm. you spent some time growing up at those same type of festivals and hopping into those jam sessions too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my son, Matt, he, uh, he traveled with me from the time he was, a, he was a little kid because he always wanted to go out of town with me. And we'd always go out of town and, and, and he was around all these people and they got to be his friend. And, and he went from, uh, it's funny, it's went from uh, Phil's son to now it's, uh, you know, it's Matt's dad. That's who it's, I get introduced as Matt's dad. And uh, it's, it's good, I, I, I like that. But Matt has turned into a great dobro player. And not only that, a really good singer. And he works with the Dale and Bradley band now. He he took my job. I left, and they had a couple of people that didn't work out. And then I kept telling Dale Ann about Matt. I said you got to hear him. He plays really good now. And now he's like her her right hander. He uh, he handles everything, takes care of stuff, and and he's not only learned to be a good player, but he knows the business. So uh, you know, but he's got four kids too. So. Uh, he still has to work hard, but uh, he finds time. Good player. But you mentioned players. There's a lot of young ones out there right now, a bunch of young kids that are doing things uh, that are amazing on, on a dobro right now. Uh, I have to tell you this, and I swear, I swear this is true, but uh, we were talking about a dobro player. Uh, I was at Jerry Douglas' house here not too long back, and uh, – we were talking about a certain dobro player and Jerry said, man, he played some kind of lick. And I went back and he goes, I don't know how he's played it. And I'm thinking, wow, Jerry Douglas didn't know how to play this lick. I mean, I'm sure Jerry would figure it out, but sure. it shows you how these kids are stretching because they're learning all this new theory and they're learning uh, how to play stuff on guitar and banjos and jumping open dobro, dobro players. So there's a bunch of them. And I'm glad I came up when I did because right now I would be a roadie in a bluegrass band uh, if they had a dobro player because they got they got so many good ones out there. Man, YouTube—that's how that's how the kids are learning today, man. It's it's awesome. Uh, 
It's it awesome. is. It, it is. Uh, and I mentioned, like, before we come on, I've been working on a Victrola watching YouTube. YouTube's <laughs> a way to do everything nowadays, you know. Yeah, yeah and, that's really awesome. And, well, can I take it back to the guitar for a bit? I know that we, sure. we, we worked pretty closely when we were actually finalizing the designs. What mm -hmm. were some parts that you really thought were essential that we got right when oh, it came yeah. Together. Well, getting rid of that sound well was a big thing. Sound well, well, when it was built, it was a good idea, I guess. But as time went, they found that it was stopping air. Uh, it was restricting movement of air. So we got rid of that and put sound posts in, the, in it like a violin. And uh, it was cool working with Greg because Greg would always say, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can do that. He'd say, maybe, maybe, maybe. So I told him uh, I wanted a, a little bit weaker body. We couldn't do that, but when we got the sound post in, big body didn't matter anymore because we had a lot of times with big body, you still got things restricting air in there. And Greg has this guitar fixed where it's like a hundred percent clear in there, so you don't really need a big body, you've got all that room, so that was really good. The uh, I don't know, I look at, I look at this thing and it's just really. The, the finish on it is just, is awesome. I got it right here. Let me, let me get it up here. Uh, look at this. I mean, this is, can I tell the price on these things for retail rooms? Uh, I, I, I think so, yes. <laughs> I know these things are running around $700. Uh, I think it might be slightly up from that. I'm so when, but, but, that's what, but that's a price without a case, or I, or it's, well, I'll say this. It's not over a thousand. Definitely okay. not over a thousand. All right. Look at the back on this thing. I mean, that's that's two thousand dollar guitar uh, right there, the way it looks. The front of it, that wouldn't be a shame well, I to get a message. It. Phil, you were right. Seven hundred dollars. Exactly. Ah, I see. I see. Did that come from way up above? It came from way up above, yeah, right in, right into my uh Run into my oracle. <laughs> well, see now, you, I'm the one pricing these. I know what that now. Uh, <laughs> look at the front on this. We went with the open sound wells. And I was talking about that. I, I've always thought that was I, so cool. It's kind of like how it, like it, like it, well, with no grill or something like that. Yeah, it is. Let me tell you about these, and, and I can stand behind what I tell you on these. I saw Jerry Douglas with his sound wells out. He used to play them with them out. And, and, you know, I knew Jerry had told me the reason he took them out is because everybody thought he had some kind of mysterious reason. He didn't. He took them out because he had a pickup and he had to run them through. So he just took them out. Well, I still thought that looked really cool, but I thought, wouldn't it really be cool if, uh, you know, you, you had these rings and took the screen out of them? And, I you know, like I mentioned, I saw Jerry Douglas do this for pickup but he didn't put the rings back in you know the rings were, were never put back in from him so i started doing this and it was funny it was like a short time later i started seeing people popping up with these and they put a name on them and i thought well, uh well i guess i can't fight for it but i know that i came up with with those and i've still got my first set because i get used to get cut on them all the time they were loose and the screen hadn't come all the way out and you try to grab them and get cut but, you know, I'll, I'll take some credit or I will take the credit uh, on using these early and maybe being the first that I ever saw. And uh, I, people just started doing them later when they started going to these uh, rings. And I just thought, you know, this looks really good uh, on the, those and I'm going to keep doing them. And another thing I like is I really like the, the black uh, tuning knobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on those i uh, see that that right there if you look at that 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 doesn't look like a cheap guitar and it's not it's built it's a you said now we can say it's seven hundred dollars it's a seven hundred dollar it's a it's an average of seven hundred dollars built like a two thousand dollar guitar uh it really is i mean this thing i've had it apart and looked at it and I've seen guitars before that people have built that were big companies and had took them apart and they were messy. They had glue, they had all kinds of stuff in them. And these guitars, I mean, I know they're made in China, but I tell you what, it, do, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, that doesn't matter. 
all that matters is whether it's made in China or if it's made on the moon. These guys are doing these things right. And uh, I've had this apart. The glue lines are perfect. I mean, in these things. And uh, I can just say, first time I took it apart and saw it apart, which I don't take my own apart anymore. I got a guy named Bobby Wright that does these, that sits them up. Uh, but man, they're coming from the factory sounding really, really good. You don't even need a setup guy now on them. They're doing, you know, the first ones you just kind of, they were learning, but man, they've got it. They've got it all down now. They're super so, uh, I agree. Yeah. I agree. They're just, uh, they're awesome. And I've had, I had a guy ask me the other day that I knew he's all about politics and he kept saying, where have they built? Where have they built? And I said, Hey buddy. You know, they were built in China, but it doesn't matter. I don't care. Uh, if, what do I need to do to make you happy to move these guys to the United States? They can outbuild anybody right now. Uh, I mean, I know there's a lot of good builders, but man, these guys are building these things like they're not coming off a of production line. It's like they're uh, like the custom builds that people build individually. These guitars look like that. And, uh, they turned out really great. Uh, the, the flame on them is really nice. They're super loud. I was going to ask you, do you think the removing the screens has a, an effect on the okay. tone? Yeah. More air movement. Uh, I'm going to put my picks on here a little bit and and kind of let you hear it a little. I've been out of practice, of course, like a lot of other musicians with this uh, COVID-19. But yeah, I think everything in this thing, one thing I noticed that uh, I'll, turn, I'll turn the screen down soon. A strap on. I always tell people you always need to wear that because I've seen people drop no pros. And the <laughs> second thing is when you stand up, it stays at the same position, you know. Uh, you'll see these guys play it out on their knees and they stand up with a strap and it's like they're lost. But uh, yeah, let me turn this screen down. I'm gonna see if I can do this without falling on the screen all the way. Can you see any of that? Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, uh, watch the screen fall. Uh, anyway, uh, See, listen. sounds really good it sounds I, great I, it sounds I great think, and uh i'm gonna flip the screen back up where i can talk to you a little bit but uh let me, let me get it back over here get my screen up without let me do this without hey i did it there we are uh i'm trying to get into the video age of all me some lighting and stuff and and i'm trying to get used to this because i'm doing so much stuff now that's video i mean i did uh, I do my thing every Thursday night, and then I do some other stuff. And and I was talking to Alan Bobby. Alan's the man on player with us. He's one of these guys that uh, everything's got to be done right. So uh, I felt good the other day. I had ordered me some lights, and Alan said, man, I got me some killer lights. I asked him what he got, and we got the same one. So I thought, no, nice. I have to go. <laughs> So uh, now he's researching out microphones that uh, are pretty good. So. I'm going to move into that age with him a little. Uh, yeah, that's great. It's super duper easy. You would be amazed at how easy it is to just connect and get going immediately. Oh, yeah. That's what I want to do. And, and I'm going to up one on him since I do my Thursday night. I'm going to get me a small teleprompter. I there you go. Good. There you go. That way I would remember things like I told you uh, earlier when I was trying to think of people's names that throw my teleprompter, <laughs> you know, works out. But uh Anyway, uh, I think you guys are just doing awesome work and all Thank the uh, customer service is great on um, everything you guys are making. So uh, I tell everybody, I mean, now that's looking for not only rezos, but looking for other stuff. I mean, you're all's mandolin line and banjo line, uh, all that stuff at Madison Banjo. I mean, everything you guys are making. Are, is really good right now. Thank and you. Uh, thank you. And and the new guitars, man. I've had more people asking about the uh, 
uh, what's the one that's got the uh, Conewood Reserve? The, yeah, there's another one. It's got a certain amount of top on it. It's a four or five. Yeah, four to five. Yeah, yeah. yeah, man, that's a home run. All those are home run. Uh, it's well, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Coming from you, that really, really means a lot. I mean, well, I mean, I mean that. I tell people all the time, you know, why do you want to throw away all this extra money, you know, on these instruments and stuff? Uh, get you, get you one of these. And you know, sometimes I think it's a thing with people. It's a have to thing. It's like, you know, if it don't say Martin on it or something, I don't want it. But these guitars that you guys are making, you know, uh, it's, I tell people, I say, this is a different recording king than what you were used to years ago. It's a whole new, whole new thing that they're making stuff and they can compete with anybody out there. And uh, not only compete, but, but win in a lot of this stuff. Well, and there's a lot of good guitars out there. We, we hope that there people is. check out ours for sure. There is, but, but in that price that price area, you, I don't know of any that I've seen better in those price ranges. It's, a, it, I mean, that's, if somebody's going to start out uh, recording King, I think King is the way to go, I think. Well, thank you very much. We really, really appreciate that. Hopefully we'll see you on stage with that resonator very soon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right now it's kind of funny. I'm in uh, dialysis. Uh, I love you folks know me. I've been dealing with cancer for 10 years. And I'm in dialysis right now. And it's uh, funny, uh, I, I was late getting into dialysis the other morning and I forgot to take my Zyrtec. So what did I do? I go in and I'm coughing. Next thing I know, I'm in isolation and uh, getting my third COVID test in two weeks. And I know I don't have it. I mean, I got my Zyrtec and I'm okay. But I found out when I was in isolation, I like it pretty good there because there's not anybody to bother you. <laughs> and uh, I've been able just to set a work desk up in there and, and do my work. So I think I'm going to start coughing when I go back again so I can stay in isolation. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully this stuff will let up soon and we can all be back out there picking and, and stuff. And uh, In the meantime, you you're doing something on Thursday nights. Can you talk a little bit about how people yeah, follow yeah. up with what you're doing? Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a little fun thing. I do a thing called uh, Uncle's. Uh, people, let me tell you real quick on the name Uncle. I don't think anybody's ever known that on me, but I was a nurse for many years and I had uh, uh, coma patients. All my patients were usually in comas because we were a head injury rehabilitation uh, facility. So I had this little boy and uh, it was funny, the whole, whole story on this, but he, he woke up out of his coma and uh, he looked at me and he goes, Uncle. He goes, what you doing in here? Well, that day, you know, uh, I told him, I said, man, your first words were uncle. He called me uncle. And he said, can I call you Uncle Phil? So it stuck from there. So anyway, what I'm doing now on Thursday night, I just call it Uncle's Throwback Thursday. And my format is this. I mean, I come through and basically I show albums that have influenced me, talk a little bit about them. I've got so many, it's hard to do one a night. I have to do like four, you know. And we last, like last night now, I'm moving on past bluegrass and th things that I paid attention to. I'm, I'm doing Jim Croce stuff right now, uh, his music. So uh, anyway, we go through that, and I go through, uh, I collect a lot of toys. See a bunch of stuff behind me. I always talk a little about a toy of the night. And then I talk, uh, we go through and I talk about, uh, you know, playing, uh, good habits, bad habits, uh, talk about uh, how to uh, start solos, how to uh, work in a band, you know, and I get people ask me questions beforehand. So I get a lot of rezzo questions like, you know, uh, what kind of slide do I need? What kind I of bet, I bet, I bet. All that stuff. But it, it goes good. It's on Thursday night and uh it's at eight o'clock uh, Eastern Standard, seven Central, and uh, you should join us. It's uh, where are you doing it? Well, can you can you say where where it will be? Is it on YouTube? Yeah, yeah. Well, where it's at right now is on my Facebook page. Got it. And I'm I am maxed out right now, but we're putting it now over to the All Stars page because it's unlimited, and uh, so it's Phil Ledbetter and the All Stars of Bluegrass. You go over there, and you can watch it there. We're trying to get that site built. 
And then and my website is unclefieldonline.com. So you can go over there and, uh, you know, I'm eventually going to make that a little more uh, workable where we'll have some music to play to, tabs and stuff. But right now it's mainly like a lot of stuff, a lot of records I've played on, a lot of history, a lot of cool pictures, things like that. So uh, do t- check me out on the Uncle's Throwback Thursday at the All-Stars of Bluegrass. Bill led better in the All-Stars of Bluegrass.com. That's awesome. We will definitely do that. I think I have a question here from uh, from a viewer. Hold on one second. Okay. Uh, this is regarding the the res- your signature model. Why did you choose the narrower nut width? Well, it was kind of funny. I've had a lot of questions on that. And that wasn't really something we decided. It was just something they gave me a couple of different nuts. And this one felt really good because, you know, I look at it this way uh, with, with this. A lot of people will see some important player doing things a certain way and they try to do it that way it's not all about that you have to do what's best for you and what i like about the nut width being a little more narrow you know you know you got to be more accurate up there because the strings are closer but you can play faster Uh, it increases your speed because the strings are closer Mm -hmm. so your pull-offs your snap pull-offs snaps pull-offs hammer-ons they're a lot closer they're a lot trickier but the thing about it, you know, uh, everybody I know that has played this thing is good with the the spacing. It's just uh, it's like anything. You got to learn, and and you play it a few times, and then you know it's it just works. And there's no way of making it wider because of the neck that we decided on, unless you flared it out. But I don't see anybody really having a problem with that, other than people a lot of times have talked in groups about nut nut width, nut width, and all this, and they think it's going to be that way. But that's kind of what happened with this. It was just something we decided. uh, We tried several, and this one felt the best. But I appreciate the question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Well, I really want to say thank you very much for joining us. It is so awesome to have a conversation with you. And I just want to say personally, you're absolutely one of the nicest most friendly people we've had tons of conversations and in every mm-hmm. single time you've just been a, a gracious gentleman and just such a pleasure to talk to so oh, thank always, you. Thank always, you. A pleasure, always a pleasure phil uh everyone thank you so much for watching you can tune in next week we'll have another live stream as well for now have a great weekend thanks again to phil and uh, we'll see you all next time thank you